All right, let's get this party started. Welcome, class, to Classics 160B1. Meet the Ancients! I, of course, am your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we are going to be, um, well, we're going to be conquering Italy to begin with, and then we are going to make our way outside the Italian peninsula uh, and start fighting battles abroad. So that is our goal today. So let's go ahead and turn down the lights, bring down the projector, fire this thing up for lecture 10.2, The Punic Wars. All right, let's see what we've got on the docket today. Uh, a few announcements to begin with. We are going to recap the early Republic, and um, we didn't uh, actually get to some of the developments of the early Republic, so that's something that we'll cover anew. Then we're going to take our uh, conquest to the Italian peninsula. Um, we'll see some of the different battles that Rome is fighting against the different tribes of Italy, right? You've seen that map with all those tribes a bunch of times. Now Rome's going to take them all over. And then we are going to see Rome come to heads with a very legitimate military power, uh, the mighty city-state of Carthage and its allies, uh, and we will at least see the beginning of these Punic Wars um, and see Rome launch itself from kind of a regional power in Italy to really a uh, imperial power across the Mediterranean. Okay, so what do we have announcement-wise? Pretty much the same thing as last time. Uh, go ahead and put this thing into speaker view. Um, again, my internet is totally wonky today. Uh, it's been going in and out, and so I'm just streaming this whole thing through the phone. Um, hopefully, the connection's good. Uh, if it's not, a non-laggy version will be up on YouTube. I'm recording this locally as well, so I'll put that kind of local version up on YouTube sometime by the end of the day, so you can always check in there. Um, if you have a question, go ahead and shoot that to your TA. They will get back to you the best they can. Uh, and as you start working on your research proposal, your revised draft, uh, remember that if you take this thing either to the Think Tank Writing Center or to the Writing Skills Improvement Program and work on it with somebody, um, I will go ahead and give you, uh, bump you up half, half a letter grade on your, uh, your revised research proposal. Uh, and TAs, um, I still got to get you that spreadsheet. Did I already get you that spreadsheet? I'll get you another spreadsheet, all right? Uh, and then you guys can keep track of um, who has submitted that. It is due April 9th, all right? April the 9th. The 9th of April is the due date, all right? So ideally, try to get a draft of your revised version done before that. You can take that over to the Think Tank Writing Center, and then you can go ahead and get your extra credit on this. Okay, so let's go ahead and recap where we left off with the early Republic. I'm drinking uh, regular water today, and it's not very exciting. So, I don't know. We, you know, <laughs> they can't all be winners. Um, hold on, one more quick question in the chat. If we already got 100%, can we still get extra credit? Um, sure, yeah. I mean, if if you're like revised, oh, well, so remember, the, this extra credit is actually gonna go onto the revised version, which is good for you. That's worth more than the original draft. Um, but if you write a perfect revised research proposal and you have taken it to uh, Think Tank or something along those lines, Sure, I don't see why we can't. We can fix that in, in D2L and allow it to go over 100. Absolutely. Um, okay, so last time we saw the fall of the monarchy, right? And the rise of the Roman Republic. And in large part, right, it was these two people, Lucius Junius Brutus and Lucius Tarquinius Colatinus, uh, leading the charge to get old Tarquin the Proud out of there and get the senators in there um, in terms of uh, establishing a representative republic, right? Um, and the guiding ideology of this whole thing is no more kings in Rome, right? Tarquin the Proud and his family ended up being so, so bad that for the next 500 years, the idea of the Roman Republic is no single person rules, right? I mean, you can have it in an emergency like a dictator. We saw that actually with Cincinnatus, but... There's no like kingship that, you know, passes on from father to son or anything like that, right? 
So that's the, that is the ideology of the Republic. No more kings in Rome. Now, when we go back to this slide, our guy on the left here, uh, Lucius Junius Brutus, he's actually an important guy to remember um, because his great, 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 I don't know, however many greats, grandson is a guy named Marcus Junius Brutus, who you may have heard of uh, because he was very good friends with Julius Caesar. And that famous quote, A2 Brute, is about this guy's great, 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 great grandson. So this is gonna become important in another week or so when we get to Caesar, uh, because it's very symbolic that Marcus Junius's Brutus's, Marcus Junius Brutus's great, 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 great grandfather was the guy who kicked out the last king in Rome. And so when his great, 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 great grandson, Marcus Junius Brutus, is involved in the assassination of Caesar because Caesar was acting too much like a king, it's very symbolic, that connection between uh, Lucius kicking out the, the last king of Rome and Marcus uh, participating in that assassination. So very interesting connection through the ages there. All right. So that's the guiding ideology. And we talked last time about how this actually is set up uh, with elected positions. And then those people who are elected actually end up making the rules, right? And the highest position that I want you guys to remember here, right, is the consul or the consulship. Um, and there's always two of them ruling at any given time. And they only rule for a year, right? Those are the kind of rules of the consulship. And then when we look at the Senate over here, right, the Senate's an advisory body. It's not really the one making the rules, but for hundreds of years, it's traditionally consulted to make sure that any of the rules are good. And we'll see that become a problem next week. Now, one of the other things that we looked at last time, right, uh, were these kind of semi-historical, semi-mythological heroes of the early Roman Republic, right? So we saw Horatius Cocles defending the Sublician Bridge, right? So the Etruscans are on one side ready to attack Rome and Horatius Cocles says, Romans get back and destroy the bridge behind me. And he sits there and he fends off the Etruscans until his very last stand. And according to one version, he actually ends up um, then jumping in to the Tiber River uh, and being saved. And according to another version, he's actually killed there. Um, but either way, right, he becomes one of these famous early Roman heroes for his bravery at the Sublician Bridge. And then we talked about Mucius Scaevola, right? And he's one of these assassins sent to kill the Etruscan king, Lars Porsena. And it goes really, really well until the very end when he mistakes the king for his bodyguard and he tries to kill the bodyguard instead, and then he's discovered. But in the aftermath of that, right, he sticks his, his hand into the fire, and he tells Lars Porsena that he is just one of 300 Romans who have sworn to not rest until this king is assassinated. And he's saying this as his hand is burning off in the fire. And Lars Porsena, the Etruscan king, just gets so scared that he's like, all right, I want nothing more to do with this. And he gets out of there, right? And then we talked about good old Cincinnatus here, right? So Cincinnatus was one of the consuls early on in his career, but then he retires, right? After his time's up, he retires, he becomes a farmer, um, and, you know, he's living the nice pastoral life. But then when Rome comes under attack, they bring Cincinnatus back, right? They appoint him dictator. And we talked a little bit about how the dictatorship in Rome is a temporary position that people could be appointed to in times of crisis, right? And what this does is it gives the one person, we were talking about Cincinnati last time, right? And Cincinnati was appointed dictator, and as dictator, right, uh, he has sole control of Rome, he's able to defeat the invading tribe, uh, and then here's the kicker, right? This is why Cincinnati is such a big deal, is because he ends up, um, then relinquishing his dictatorial duties and going back to being a farmer. And as we'll see next week, the big problem the Roman Republic runs into is that later on, nobody wants to give up power. 
right? They start coming up with real wacky ways to become like consul like seven times in a row, uh, to become a dictator for life. They're coming up with whatever they can to not give up power. And that's why when you look back at Cincinnati, like that's his big thing, right? He did his duty when he was called to do it. And then he gave up power afterwards. So he's one of those heroes of the early Roman Republic. Okay, and then we concluded last time, right, uh, with the sack of Rome. In 390 BC, we get the Gauls coming in from the north. Uh, and the Gauls, right, that's what we associate with modern day France. They're going to come back in our story a little bit later on with Julius Caesar. And in large part, as Julius Caesar is going on his conquest of this region, he's kind of looking back at this early time period um, as a justification for why he's able to go ahead and conquer those people. But at the end, right after the Gauls conquer the city, what he ends up doing, right? Uh, the Romans complain that they're having to pay too much money. And, oh, um, yeah, the, the Romans have to pay too much money. And the Gallic general just throws his sword on the scales and says, you know, vi victus, woe to the conquered. You have to put up with whatever we want to. All right. So in 390, right, Rome is sacked. They have to pay off this huge ransom to the Gallic general Brennus, but then they get it back together, all right? Um, so at this time, right, if we're looking at this map, uh, we're still talking about Rome just having a little bit of territory right there. And what they do in the aftermath is they build their first kind of major wall around the city, right? We've seen this before. It's called the Servian Wall because traditionally it's associated with that king of Rome, Servius Tullius. But in actuality, um, it's really uh, rather um, dating to the, the fourth century, right? Right after the sack of Rome. That's archaeologically when we think this thing dates to. And you know my favorite thing, that you can go eat McDonald's right in the middle of the Servian Wall in Rome's train station. Now, what Rome does after that is they get back on their horse and they start conquering again. And so what we end up seeing uh, is they start taking over, right? All these different little areas. We saw them fight the Iqui earlier. That's where Cincinnati comes in. We saw the uh, the conquest of the Sabines earlier and they're brought to Rome. We heard the story of Alba Longa going into Rome uh, under Tullus Hostilius, right? With the Battle of the Horati and the Curati. Um, and Tusculum, one of these other towns, where is Tusculum? There it is, there's Tusculum. Um, they are made the first municipium. And this is, um, you know, where we get our word muni municipality. But Rome's trying to think now, what are the different ways that they can bring in the towns that they've conquered? Now, one of the ways that they do that is they give various levels of citizenship to these towns. Now, Roman citizenship does a couple things. It gives you the right to vote. It allows you to participate in government. You can legally make contracts. You can marry a Roman citizen. Otherwise, you're prevented from doing so. Um, you maintain your status whenever you move around the empire, right? Later on, there are a lot of Roman colonies, but you retain your status as a Roman once you get Roman citizenship. You're immune from some taxes. And this happens especially as Rome starts to expand. They're able to take money uh, from the areas that they're conquering and they gave, give tax breaks to their citizens. Then it gives you a series of other legal uh, benefits as well, the ability to sue, the right to a trial, the right to appeal, that sort of thing. And so here's some of the different ways that Rome actually approaches that when it comes to integrating the areas that they're conquering, right? Um, so for instance, right, there's kind of different levels. So Latin allies are allowed to marry and conduct commerce. Municipia come in at a couple different levels. You could have full citizenship. You could have a kind of lower level of municipium um, without full voting rights. Uh, different colonies have kind of different levels of rights. Roman allies are technically free, but actually Rome controls them uh, militarily. And the kind of idea here is you don't need to remember the exact details of each one of these. But what I do want you to remember is that Rome is kind of putting this thing together piecemeal as they go, right? They're getting powerful, they're conquering areas, 
and they're kind of coming up with different strategies for how to bring these areas under Roman control at different levels, sometimes very strongly under Roman control, sometimes more of like an alliance um, that's kind of loosely under Roman control. Okay, so what happens when Rome kind of gets out, right? We've seen that map a couple times. Where were we on that map? Yeah, we've seen this map a couple times, right? Um, up into the, the kind of fourth century, Rome is still really, really, really small. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna see how Rome goes from just this tiny little very dark red area here to owning the entire Italian peninsula. So that first begins with a series of wars known as the Samnite Wars. And these Samnites are this group right down here, kind of in Southern Italy, all right? Um, they end up being fairly strong warriors. They're difficult to deal with. Uh, it's tough to tell on this map, but this is right in the middle of the Apennine Mountains. So there's a mountain range running through there, uh, which makes it difficult to have a large scale battle, right? But by 290, uh, Rome is eventually able to defeat the Samnites and they've been able to really expand their power um, outside of that little area that we used to have, right? So here's where we were. Uh, and then eventually by the early third century, Rome's got kind of the, the central part of Italy there. And now they start turning their sights towards the south, right? This region that we call Magna Graecia. And the way that Rome starts to bring this region under Roman power is through a series of wars called the Pyrrhic Wars, right? And if you've ever heard of a Pyrrhic victory, that these series of wars are where that comes from. Now, this guy, the general Pyrrhus, is not a Roman general, uh, but rather he's a Greek general from this kind of region of Epirus, right? Um, this is kind of a backwater within Greece, but he decides he's gonna make a name for himself in the aftermath of Alexander the Great, right? We can see timeline-wise, this is just shortly after Alexander. And he does so by going around to conquer a bunch of different areas here. Now, what Rome does is they use his invasion of southern Italy as an excuse to come help out some Roman allies. And kind of in the helping out of these Roman allies, they're kind of slowly able to start incorporating them a little bit more closely under Roman power. Now, in the early days of the invasion of Pyrrhus, he's able to win a series of victories. But the first victory costs him a lot of troops. And the second victory, it, it costs him even more troops. And by the time he finishes that second victory, instead of him, like, if he wins one more battle like this, he's going to have lost the war, right? That's where we get our term Pyrrhic victory, where you may win, but that win is so costly that you might actually be worse off for having done so. Okay, so after defeating Pyrrhus and kind of bringing in these allied areas um, in the aftermath of his invasion of Southern Italy, Rome by kind of the early part of the third century now owns the whole lower half of Italy. You'll notice up here, right? They still haven't beat the Etruscans. And up here, that's where the Celts are, right? They still haven't made any progress against the Celts. But the entire southern part of Italy now is under Roman control. Now, the Romans end up going after the Etruscans in much the same way um, as they'll end up going after the successor kingdoms to Alexander. And that's by trying to pick them off one by one and make alliances with some of them against other ones, right? They are using the fact that the Etruscans are a series of independently owned city-states, right? Independently governed city-states. They're trying to use that to their advantage. Okay, so uh, the last of these, right? After picking off a bunch of them uh, is the city of Volsini, which many historians and archeologists associate with the modern town of Orvieto. And if you ever get the chance to study abroad and you go to Italy, this is exactly where you're gonna be. And it's super cool, right? I mean, this is like the type of medieval Italian town that you think about uh, when you're daydreaming in class. It's built on these rocky, rocky cliffs, which were 
like intentionally built that way by the Etruscans, right? The Etruscans actually took the natural rocky outcropping and shaved it down into these sheer cliffs here. So they've actually kind of constructed that sheer drop off as a defense mechanism. Now, the Romans get there uh, and they start attacking the city. They besiege the city and they just can't get in, right? The cliffs are too sheer. Um, and then they, what they do instead is surround the city and essentially try to um, keep the, basically starve the Etruscans out of there. Now, when you go to Orvieto, there's actually a series of caves that go down from the, uh, the kind of top of the Acropolis here, right? Um, and in those caves, uh, you can see um, wells. So they were able to get water by digging deep down uh, wells from the top here. And then you also see these dove coats. And what those are, um, are kind of different um, little areas where birds would live in these caves, right? Then they'd have little holes where they can fly out. They, the birds themselves can go get food. And then the Romans can actually eat the birds when they become of age. Or sorry, the Etruscans can. So that was one way that they stayed fed uh, during this invasion. Now, Rome never actually makes its way in there by force. But after two years, Rome or the Etruscans have just had enough, right? It's two years of eating nothing but birds uh, and having to drink the well water, and they give up um, in 264. And that's the last of the Etruscan holdouts, uh, which again um, is um, commonly associated with the modern city of Orvieto. And it's kind of cool that that term Orvieto actually comes from the, the Latin term for this town, which was called the Urbs Vitus. Urbs Vitus turns into Orvieto. And they called it the Old City because after Rome took over, they took the entire population that was living there and they displaced them about 20 miles away um, over to Lake Bolsena. Um, and Bolsena uh, etymologically is related to that term Volsini. That's the kind of connection. So the whole population gets moved in the aftermath of, uh, of Rome taking over the city. Okay, so by 264, now they've defeated the Samnites in central Italy. They've defeated Pyrrhus and incorporated all of southern Italy. And now they defeated uh, the Etruscans at Volsini, modern Orvieto, uh, the last of the Etruscan holdouts. And at this point in time, they've got the vast majority of the Italian peninsula Eh, it still takes them quite a while to get to the Celts up here. But for all intents and purposes, they have got um, the Italian peninsula by the middle of the third century, this date of 264. Let me get out of the way so you can actually see it. 264 BCE. All right, now, what are some of the developments of this period of time uh, in the early Republic? So for one, Rome starts fighting its battles in an entirely new way. So we talked a lot about phalanx warfare when we were talking about the Greeks. Well, Professor Ruby's here. Ruby, you want to come up? Come on. Come here. She does not seem to want to be <laughs> come up here and teach today. Ruby, come on. Come here. Come on. Now, she doesn't want to teach. Can't make her teach. Anyway, we talked about phalanx warfare, right? And how it was really, really strong with everybody working together. Now she's back. Now she, she's eating a towel. Um, the, the Roman army, right? Uh, instead of adopting a phalanx strategy, they organize their army into something called maniples, um, which are these kind of groups uh, of soldiers that are maybe a couple hundred people each, a little less than that. And what this does, right, is that then they, they kind of organize these maniples um, into this kind of gridded formation, which we call a quincunx. Um, and what this does uh, is it allows for incredible levels of adaptation, right? The Greek phalanx was incredibly strong when everybody worked together and moved as one, but it was really hard to adjust on the fly. Because if you had anybody breaking away from the group, they would get killed immediately because they're too heavily armored. They got such a long, long spear. They just aren't quick at movement. Uh, so if they're getting flanked or something, it can be very difficult. 
The Roman legions, on the other hand, they are incredibly flexible. Because they're grouped in these smaller groups, and because uh, each of those groups has this kind of chain of command, they can break off in a lot of different forms to cover uh, what they, they, to adjust to what they need to adjust to. So the new form of the Manipular Legion uh, is one of the big developments of the early Republic. The Port of Ostia, right? Remember we talked about how this was the development of Tarquin the Elder, right? Tarquinius Priscus. Um, what we think archeologically, just how the, uh, the Servian Wall, we think archeologically actually dates to the fourth century. We also think the site of Ostia, even though traditionally it gets associated with the kings, was founded somewhere in the fourth century. And that's a really big development, again, because as you can see here, this is associated with the site, or with the port of Rome. So Rome is connected to Ostia by the Tiber River. Ostia is on the Mediterranean Sea. All the major shipments coming, coming into Rome are coming through the port of Ostia. And it also makes for a kind of nice defense point as well, because the river gets narrow enough that you can't take big warships all the way to Rome. Um, and so warships have to basically stop at Ostia and they can't get to the actual city of Rome. We get the, um, the first kind of port and the earliest forum in the city of Rome as well. Uh, so the Roman forum as we know it, um, is between the Capitoline and the Palatine Hill, uh, but we get the uh, cattle market down by the river during this period of time. Uh, and then we get the earliest port that's on the, uh, the, the river itself. Um, and that would be right in this region here. And if you go to that region today, you can still see some of the ancient Roman temples there. This temple, uh, the circular one to Hercules Victor, uh, and then there's a temple to the god Portunus, right? The god of ports. We get one of the most famous Roman roads of all time. So the Via Appia, or the Appia Antica, the ancient Appian Way, um, was built in 312, and it connects the city of Rome, kind of in the central part of Italy, to the city of Brundisium, way in the southeastern part uh, of Italy. And one of the things that, that this kind of does is it allows for really efficient um, transportation within the Italian peninsula, right? These Roman roads, they're immaculately constructed. It's something like seven or eight different kinds of layers and flattening and gravel uh, and drainage and then paving stones. There's all, there's like a very set way that you build a Roman road um, and these are still preserved today. So it's kind of cool. You can actually walk out onto the Via Appia right outside the city of Rome. Um, it's kind of dangerous. There's about, there's about a half mile, maybe a half mile to a mile, where you walk out of the city gate, the ancient city gate to the city, and then you're just on a modern road, and you're like very close to getting run over almost the entire time. And then eventually it branches off and you see the ancient road there, and then it's a very, very pleasant walk. And what you see along the way are actually tombs. You weren't allowed to bury the dead within the city walls in antiquity. And so the deceased frequently, um, place their funerary monuments along the roads that lead into the city so that people would see them and remember them along the way. We get our oldest aqueduct, or at least in this case, our second oldest aqueduct um, in 272 BC. We have the Anio Vetus, one of the very well-preserved ones here. Um, a lot of it still survives today. Uh, and aqueducts are absolutely huge to the growth of Rome, right? What these are doing is bringing fresh, clean water into the growing city. Now, if you don't have fresh, clean water and water sitting around, that leads to disease. And you don't want that if you're a burgeoning city with increasing density. And so this is one of more than a dozen aqueducts feeding into the city of Rome. Um, and it's kind of amazing that they're able to do this, right? It's over the course of like dozens of miles coming from pretty far away. And what they're able to do is grade that thing very, very finely across the entire distance uh, so that water does flow. It's constantly flowing because it's going downhill, but it never gets moving so fast that it all splashes out over the side. Um, so really quite the engineering marvel. 
one of the cool things today in the city of Rome is that sometimes uh, houses are still fed by kind of ancient aqueduct sources. And the property values, to some extent, are governed by which aqueduct you get your water from because some are known to have even better waters, uh, better water than others. So it's got kind of a cool way that these ancient Roman developments are still applicable in the world today. All right, and then coinage, right? This was another thing that we had chalked up to the kings uh, when in reality it appears to be more um, of an early Republican period development. Right? So early on, uh, we get these ice rudes, these kind of like crude um, lumps of bronze. Next, that ends up turning in to a lump of bronze that's been stamped by some government, right? Like by the Roman government, it stamps some animal on there. And then that eventually evolves into the first like kind of form of coinage, right? Where they start stamping gods and things like that on there. And you think about what coinage does is that when it's produced by the government, what this allows for uh, is for people to no longer have to barter, right? Instead of bartering, you can produce the one thing that you're really good at, sell that at a market, take the coins from that, and then go purchase whatever you want. And so it kind of lowers what we'd call transaction costs uh, of doing business, um, and that helps the economy in the early days of Rome. So in terms of some of our early Roman developments, right, just to cover that again, what we've got is we've got a new form of army based on the legion. And the legion is, is impressive compared to the phalanx because of its flexibility. That is like the key kind of attribute of it. We've got the port originally attributed to the kings. We think it's, it actually dates to around the 4th century B.C., uh, we've got a port along the Tiber, actually in the city of Rome, as, long, as well as a new cattle market for the city. We've got massive Roman roads now stretching from the city of Rome uh, to the different allies and different areas that it's taking over. So the Via Appia is one of the big ones here. We've got aqueducts now going from the hills surrounding Rome into the city itself. This is the second oldest one, the Anio Vitus. Um, but there eventually are more than a dozen of these, and they stretch for dozens of miles from the hills into the city. And that clean water is really one of the, the major things that allows um, for, yeah, that allows for kind of successful um, and healthy living within a burgeoning city. And we've got coinage, right? And that allows for economic growth because it lowers these transaction costs and allows people to specialize a little further than they normally would. Oh, one kind of final uh, quick, uh, quick thing here. So our word money, right? The, the actual word money uh, comes from the temple of Juno Moneta, uh, which this is a reconstruction of the Capitoline Hill and the, two, uh, the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus here. Um, and off to the side of it was the temple of Juno Moneta, and it's actually gotten turned into a church um, in, uh, in more modern times. But Juno Moneta, this is where um, a lot of the, uh, this is where the mint for the city of Rome was housed. And that's why we have our word money coming from Juno Moneta, which served as the mint for ancient Rome. And you can still visit the building itself because it's now a modern church. All right, well, we did attendance earlier. Um, again, I apologize for the connections. I think what we'll do, why don't we save our story of the Punic Wars uh, for Friday? What we've done today is we've recapped um, both some of the legends of the early Republic, but then also Rome's conquest of the Italian peninsula and some of the developments over this period of time. And so why don't we stop there for today? Uh, and then on Friday, we will cover the Punic Wars. Um, and then next week, we are going to see what happens during the later part of the Roman Republic. All right. So thank you so much. Again, apologies for the, uh, the technical difficulties here. I will get this up as soon as I can. Um, have a, uh, a wonderful day, uh, and I look forward to seeing you Friday. All right. Bye, everyone.